Um, I was going to start uh, just by talking about uh, where this idea, the title really of the show, Through Other Eyes, came from uh, a little bit, but mostly where it's going. Um, you know, this, this thought process has been going on for a while, and this is really about where I'm at in this thinking at the moment. Uh, so it's less directly about the works in this show and more about a, a current of thought uh, that maybe surrounds them and, and will go on in interesting ways through these works and in other places in the future. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about Through Other Eyes. Um, this is actually a work that I made a few years ago now, um, which is called The Rainbow Plane. Um, it's, a, it's a ground painting. It's, it's on the floor. Um, in, it was painted in the center of Kiev in the Ukraine uh, in the middle of winter, so it was there for about a week before it got completely covered by snow. Uh, but it was really pretty uh, until the snow came. Um, and it's a uh, full size. Uh, so it's actually the size of a Gulfstream 5 jet, um, which is a, a very popular private plane uh, with oligarchs and footballers and criminals of all kinds. Um, and there's, there's a lot of stuff that, around that work. Um, but the main thing I just want to talk about right now is, is the rainbowness, uh, or why the rainbowness. Um, and what I was doing was I was reproducing something that I'd seen uh, online. Um, I've made a lot of works uh, that look at the way the world is mapped through the digital, and particularly through public maps, public digital maps like Google Maps. And as I've been scouring these, I kept coming across these. Um, this is actually a screenshot from Google Maps. Um, and when I found one of these, I, I started to find more. Uh, there, you don't see so many of them now because the systems actually got better. Um, but you see a lot of them near airports. Um, and it's, it's a rainbow plane. Um, but what it is is a photograph of a plane taken by a satellite, uh, because that's how they, they photograph the maps. And the question then becomes again, why the rainbow? What's creating this oddness? And the answer is that this isn't a photograph. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of scan. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an image made up of a number of different images that do some slightly odd and interesting things. Because this plane is moving very fast relative to the satellite. As it takes multiple images, that kind of blurs, and you see this scan. So you get the black and white, and then you get the various colors. And that's an artifact of the way these satellites see the world, uh, particular kinds of imaging satellites. Um, what was fascinating for me is that by looking at the rainbow plane, you can infer the way in which the satellite sees. You can start to understand that it doesn't see like we do in a single kind of colorful range, but actually in multiple bands, like multiple snapshots of black and white, red, green, blue, and in fact, into other bands as well. Satellites are capable of seeing in more frequencies than humans are seeing. So you can start to do really cool stuff with satellite images. This is what we call a true color image from a satellite. This is actually of Los Angeles. And so this is an image of Los Angeles made from the red, green, and blue, just as a human would see it. But as I said, the satellites can see in a greater range than the human eye can. They can see beyond red, green, and blue into the ultraviolet and into the infrared. So if you take that red, green, and blue and you add in the ultraviolet, you get an image that might look a little bit like this. In the ultraviolet, plants that are particularly healthy reflect, uh, sorry, absorb more light. So you can see in the ultraviolet which plants are healthy and which aren't. So you can see there's lots of reflectivity in the area of Los Angeles, which means there aren't a lot of healthy plants, as you might expect. Down here, along closer to the coast, and in that black area there, which is actually the aftermath of a big forest fire, but a few years later, so the plants have started to grow again, you see it gets darker because there's higher UV absorption in the plants. Likewise, if you add in the infrared, you start to see the makeup of the soil. And again, that fire area just jumps out at you because the soil underneath those healthy plants has been heavily damaged. So actually, in, in the infrared, you're able to see through that plant into the, comp into the kind of makeup of the soil itself. And you can start to see things that are not visible to the human eye. And I, I just love this. I think this is completely amazing. This is an extraordinary example of how we've built a technology that kind of expands our own vision and is useful for all kinds of scientific purposes and just generally for seeing and therefore knowing and thinking about the world in different ways. But I've been talking about all this technology stuff for, for quite a long time, and I've started to realize there's quite a big kind of missing piece in my thinking about this seeing beyond the human. Um, because lots of other things do this in interesting ways as well. Um, this is 
Um, I think this is a kind of uh, a viper, uh, if Google Images has been nice to me. Uh, but it's a snake, you can tell that. Um, snakes uh, have uh, beyond human vision in super interesting ways. In fact, there's, there's several different adaptations in snakes. Some, for example, have eyes like cats. Do you know how cats' eyes reflect really brightly when you shine a light on them? That's because they have reflective material on the back of the eye that bounces the light back and forward a few times and basically amplifies it so they can see better in the dark. Some snakes have that adaptation as well. Other snakes have an infrared adaptation. Like the satellites, they can see uh, beyond the red, green, and blue into the infrared, uh, which means they can see not just better in the dark, but see specific things in the dark. Specifically, they can see the thermal signature of prey because body heat radiates in the infrared. So snakes effectively have thermal vision, which allows them to see uh, the things that they're interested in better. And the thing about this is, when you understand how the snakes see, you can understand something of their world. Uh, the, the philosopher George Oxhold called this their umwelt, their, their mode of being in the world, their mode of understanding the world that shapes their entire kind of being in it. Um, and loads of animals have all kinds of uh, adaptations of this kind. Um, bees have a particular form of vision that allows them to see um, uh, the red, green, blue, uh, and the ultraviolet. Um, just like that satellite off the other end of the spectrum, uh, into the blue, allows them to see uh, the different uh, shapes and patterns on plants and leaves and flowers that guide them to where they need to go in ways that are completely invisible to the human. We can, get, we can take a camera and do something clever with it and see into the ultraviolet in this way, and plants look entirely differently because they've adapted to give out certain signals to guide the bees to where they need to go. These things have co-evolved, the plants and the bees together, to produce an entire world that humans have only become aware of uh, very recently, but has existed right there and completely invisibly to us all along. A, a form of kind of mutual intelligence and co-evolution that until recently we've been entirely ignorant of. The, where this for me starts to get super interesting is when we start to talk about this as not just a physical manifestation of something like vision, but when we start to think about what other adaptations might do, not just to your way of seeing the world, which obviously shapes our thinking to some extent, but into all kinds of other ways of interacting with the world, and ultimately to how our cognition is shaped. Uh, the octopus is a super interesting example about this. Um, they have a very obvious cognitive and physical difference, uh, which is that octopuses don't just have brains in their heads like we do. Uh, over 40% of the octopus's neurons are found spread throughout its body and mostly in its legs. The octopus's brain actually extends throughout its entire body. And this appears, in fact, to mean that the octopus's legs are capable of somewhat independent action. Uh, neurons in the legs fire, respond, do things without central control from the brain. And we don't really know what this must be feel like, right? For, to have your limbs essentially operating in some kind of weird political federation with your brain, where some kind of agreement happens or doesn't happen, or some kind of consensus is reached, but bodily, and kind of must be somewhat anarchically. And already we're using this word to feel, because we feel that the octopus must feel this in some way. It must feel different inside the octopus body as a result of this different uh, arrangement of, of cognition and intelligence within it. What's super interesting is octopuses exhibit all kinds of um, weird cognitive behaviors. Uh, they're super smart, basically. Uh, it's now well established that, for example, they can recognize other individuals. Uh, they have a sense of self. They can recognize other individuals of other species. Uh, they can do human face recognition. They're known in the lab to dislike particular researchers. Uh, the researchers who prod or poke them too much tend to get squirted with water when other ones uh, are kind of left alone. Uh, and they're capable of all kinds of weird escapes. If you want fun, go and look up octopus escapes on YouTube. Uh, they're just brilliant and strange and wonderful animals that it is impossible not to admit some form of intelligence to. There's a, there's a weird thing about octopuses, which is they have, um, and, and the other cephalopods, the squids and, and, and cuttlefish, they have a, an eye that looks at first sight very similar to our own. It's a, it's a kind of 
you know, uh, liquid filled orb, it has a lens, it has a retina, uh, it has nerves coming off the back of it. Um, but the thing is, the oldest common ancestor of the cephalopods and of the vertebrates is a kind of tiny blind worm that lived at the bottom of the ocean about 400, 400 million years ago. Um, which means that the eye evolved twice, right? Our shared ancestor didn't have an eye. So at some point during the vertebrate branch of the tree, the eye evolved, and at some point on the way to the cephalopods, the eye evolved, but separately. Uh, it converged onto something similar, but non-identical, because in fact the octopus eye is slightly better than ours, because the nerve attaches in such a way that they don't actually have the blind spot that we have. But the eye evolved twice, uh, and possibly many more times, throughout the history of evolution, which begs the question about octopus intelligence. Did intelligence itself develop twice, and perhaps more? That perhaps forms of intelligence, as we think about it, are not just like our intelligence. That they might actually be entirely different, strange, and alien kinds that maybe we can't even fully understand, but certainly might help us to understand the world in very different ways. There's all kinds of examples of this as you start to look further. Um, recently, uh, there was, I was reading a paper about um, plants, um, and in particular, plants' response to sound. Uh, some researchers took some plants, uh, and they put caterpillars on them. And as the caterpillars start to munch on them, the plants release uh, various chemicals to kind of strengthen their resistance. And so other leaves become kind of hardened against this attack. Uh, the researchers then took some of the same plants uh, without any caterpillars on them, but played them the sound of caterpillars munching. And immediately, the plants started to produce the same chemical. And at the moment, we have no idea how plants hear. Uh, we, and there was a lot of pushback from researchers saying, like, they can't hear. They have no sensory organs uh, that permit them to, to receive sound in this way. And yet, they show all the responses to sound that, that we would expect if they had our kind of hearing. But they don't. They exist in some kind of different sensory world, yet it is a shared world. It is a world that we're both capable of figuring out ways of addressing, communicating, even if we don't fully understand. Our attempts to understand this are often like really comical, even when it comes to species that are way, way closer to us, and that we would expect to have a, a super, uh, not, not superhuman, but very akin to human type intelligence. So we often treat apes as being essentially lesser forms of humans. One of the tests for how smart apes are is to basically give them a stick and, and some kind of puzzle that they can only figure out if they use this stick to kind of poke a thing and, and figure out the puzzle. It's a test for tool use, which is a form of intelligence. Uh, and for years, gibbons, uh, despite being apparently very smart apes in various kinds of ways, um, failed this test completely. They put the stick in there, they put in the tool, and the gibbons would just be like, didn't care. Um, and it was years of this test being failed over and over again before a researcher realized that, well, gibbons are, are brachiators. They, they, they live swinging through the trees. Their, their whole spatial arrangement, and thus their cognitive arrangement, is based on being in very different physical space to most of the other higher apes who spend more time on the ground. And when researchers redesigned the experiment, so that these sticks were kind of hanging from a large frame and accessible to the gibbons as they moved through the trees in this way, the gibbons immediately grabbed the sticks and started poking things. Right? It was our own stupidity and failure to think like the gibbon that prevented us from acknowledging the intelligence that it possessed. There's all kinds of weirdnesses down into this as we kind of get deeper into it. Um, you carry around with us, we all carry around with us, uh, two, or, two or three kilograms of other species, mostly in our gut at all times. Uh, we, are, we are possibly like the octopus, in fact, a kind of loose confederation of different life forms all walking around together. And one of the pieces of evidence for this is that your intelligence is deeply affected by the health and makeup of your gut biome. If you change the chemistry, the different bacteria and other species that are living inside your gut, it affects your cognitive performance. Uh, your, your brain will function differently based on the makeup of bacteria inhabiting your body. So we already also live uh, in some kind of uh, connection with other species that directly affects the way that we think. 
I want to know what happens when this goes way weirder and further, um, because we're only just beginning to acknowledge the deep kind of strangeness of the, uh, we're still discovering these extraordinary things about the world around us, of which this is one of my favorite examples. Uh, this is a uh, forest uh, in the southern United States, uh, which is in fact one single organism. It covers over uh, uh, 150 acres. Um, it uh, appears to be thousands and thousands of trees, uh, but is in fact one single quivering aspen root system that's over 5,000 years old and sends up trees as kind of probes, which under the ground are one, one massive organism. It's possibly one of the kind of largest uh, and oldest organisms on Earth. And it looks utterly unlike uh, what we imagine an organism uh, should look like. What, what's the difference here? When we talk about the differences between trees and forests, when we try and isolate single intelligences, examples like this point out that like the gut biome, things are rather more complicated. And we're only just discovering the intelligence of not just non-human animals, but, but non-humans more broadly, and particularly of trees and plants in the forest. Researchers now talk about a thing they call the wood wide web, which is the system of roots and fungal structures under the earth that connect plants to one another. So on the tree roots are growing forms of fungi which exchange uh, nutrients with the trees, they produce things the trees can't produce and vice versa. They swap these nutrients between them, but they also provide a communication network for the trees. So when one tree is attacked by a bug, for example, it can send a signal through this system to the other trees to warn them of this impending attack. There's a form of communication and some form of nascent intelligence involved in that communication that's symbiotic. What I love about this is, is Researchers coined this term, the World Wide Web, quite, the word Wood Wide Web, quite recently. But it was the first, the first uh, researchers who studied it were also the first, some of the first researchers to be given access to the early internet in the 1980s. And in fact, they've gone on the record saying that they only recognized what this network was because they, they knew what a computer network looked like. It required us to build a kind of technological approximation of this thing before we recognized that it already existed in a possibly far more complex and interesting way in nature itself. I'm super interested in that aspect because it tells me that a lot of the technologies that we're developing at present, uh, artificial intelligence being a really key example, uh, might actually not just be a tool unto itself that we're mostly misusing, but a tool that we could actually use to understand the natural world of which we are very much a part in entirely new ways. These technological tools often produce new ways of thinking and acting. My favorite example is um, the match between Kasparov and Deep Blue uh, back in the 90s. This, was the, this is the game in which the greatest chess player was defeated by a supercomputer, um, which was regarded as being like a moment when sort of humans lost their ascendant position. Suddenly we were no longer the smartest people. It was just chess, but we built it up to be so important. Um, and it was, it's an interesting moment. But the really interesting bit is that Kasparov came back the next year having invented something he called advanced chess. And advanced chess is chess played by human and machine cooperation. So it's what happens when a human is allowed to use a computer to play against another computer or human computer team. And the discovery of this was that um, Humans, uh, the, the humans w even the greatest human chess player, will now routinely be beaten by not even particularly the greatest supercomputer because the programs have got that good. But a human playing alongside a not particularly great computer uh, will be able to beat the biggest supercomputer. There's uh, forms of intelligence that are different when we combine them uh, as, as ways of working together in cooperation rather than in opposition or presuming that one alone is kind of superior to the others. I'm going to skip some because as usual I've gone on too long. And I'm gonna go uh, straight uh, to here um, because I love this image. Um, this is from an Australian artwork called The Parliament of Daxons. Um, I, I just, I, because I simply wanna end this by saying that the the, the place that this thinking and questioning is going to is saying that actually what we, what we might be able to learn by thinking through other eyes in these ways is not just how we see in things like the ultraviolet or in through the infrared, but how we might actually perceive the world and think the world in radically different ways. 
because we are in a time of massive crisis. We know this in multiple, multiple ways. And what we need more than anything else is other ways of thinking. And it's becoming incredibly apparent that as we focus deeply on technological tools alone, there's a wealth of ways of thinking uh, and different ways of approaching and conceptualizing the world uh, that have been with us all along and that we're just starting to notice and pull out. And for me, the, the task of the next however long, as long as it takes, is to bring into our ways of thinking and in ways that allow for the um, political and, and, and uh, vital living autonomy of other beings into our political arrangements in ways that actually allow us to cooperate and not to continue to assume that we can solve these problems entirely by ourselves. Um, and I'll end on that note, uh, so thank you very much. <laughs>